Hallelujah. I've got to hurry up before the caffeine wears off. I tell you what, you uh, mix a little caffeine and sugar in with a type A personality, you, you got a whirlwind. You got a, you got a whirlpool. You've got a whirly bird. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm one of those, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know how I've got to preach so much lately, but uh, it suits me just fine. I No, I, somebody, uh, somebody said it's because I'm the low man on the totem pole, and I'm just glad to have a place on the pole, I'll tell you that. I'm just glad to be a part of it, glad to be with you today. I uh, need to take care of some business here for just a second. Can you believe, can you believe Pastor Weaver last week said he was funnier than I am? (laughs) Pray for the man. He's getting delusional in his old age. Now, he's taller than I am. I'll I'll give him that. But I think think he and I have different kinds of humor. Uh, The difference is mine is funny. But he is taller. <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't dare stop at the end of that chapter. We want to go right into the next one uh, for our thoughts today. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And our message is based upon and built around the introductory phrase of verse 13. Paul says, but we ought always to thank God. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. How succinctly, concisely, and accurately Paul presents our salvation experience. Saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth, the Spirit and the Word. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, our Father, who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Now, you might think this old preacher is in the habit of just pulling out old sermons and re-preaching them, but you would be wrong. I can't work that way. I like fresh bread. I like the smell of it. I like mixing it up and baking it and serving it and eating it myself. I like the agony and ecstasy of teaching and preaching. I'm a glutton for punishment. Pray for me. It's Thanksgiving weekend. I hope the Thanksgiving part hasn't worn out. I am thankful for Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for this annual emphasis that that maybe helps to keep us from straying too far from an attitude of gratitude. But every day should be Thanksgiving Day in the heart of the believer. Paul says we ought to always to thank God. Now, you may be a believer who's going through an exceptionally difficult chapter in your life. The fact is, we all have difficulties and challenges and hardships 
The fact is you either are or you have been or you will face difficulty. There's, there's just no getting around it. When you come into the kingdom, God doesn't give you a card that exempts you from sickness and sorrow and hardships and heartaches. You don't stop being human. You don't stop being a part of the human condition. We ought always to thank God. You might say, well, man, that sounds good. That's, you know, I like that philosophy. But there's just too much heartache in my life to produce much thanksgiving. And I hear you, and I think if you're going through that, it's important to be heard. And I know your feelings of loss and sorrow and disappointment must be respected. And we would not make light of your hardships. But perhaps an expanded view, a somewhat augmented perspective can help you through those difficulties. And I'd be quick to remind you that the man who gave us these words in our text didn't have it so good either. The fact is, no one in this room has suffered as much as he. He was a wanted man, hunted, hated, and hounded wherever he went. And what was his crime? Loving and serving Jesus and preaching the gospel. And he documents the price he paid for that. In fact, he documents it in virtually every epistle that he writes. Certainly in First and Second Thessalonians, in First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, he says it this way, We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you His gospel in spite of strong opposition. And later in that chapter, in verse 9, surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse 3, he speaks of trials, and in verse 4 and verse 7, and persecution and distress. In this context of personal suffering, Paul says we ought always to thank God. He's either crazy or clueless, or he knows something. He has some, side, some kind of inside information. The fact is, he does, but he shares it with you and me. So first of all, let's note Paul's proclamation. The proclamation is he is thankful for what the Lord has done. Thankful for what the Lord has done. Look again in our text, verse 13, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. The first thing he notes is the Lord, the Lord loved us. In fact, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, God commended His love toward us, and Christ died for us. He loved us. Paul reiterates in verse 16, may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us. He continues in chapter 3 and verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love. That's my prayer for all of us today. May the Lord, our God, direct your hearts into God's love. And I think one of the most significant challenges many of us face, it might even be most of us, in fact, it could be all of us, is getting to the place where we unequivocally accept the fact that God loves us truly, genuinely loves us. When we are good, He loves us. When we're bad, He loves us. When we succeed, He loves us. When we fail, He loves us. He never stops loving us. I've lived long enough, seen enough, heard enough to know that a lot of people in the church have a terrible view of the Christian life and salvation and God Himself. They just don't see 
much love and grace there. And for them, it's all about fear and guilt and shame and perfectionism. We're in the 500th celebration of the Reformation and Luther before he had his revelation that led to the Reformation, so feared God, he resented his very existence. Many people have a God you cannot live with and a God you cannot live without. And their most dreaded notion is that this God will have to be dealt with forever, throughout eternity. Heaven becomes a hell with a God who is anything but love. Paul doesn't say it once, not twice, but three times. God loves us. Get it settled in your mind and in your heart. Get it settled once and for all. In verse 13, brothers loved by the Lord. Verse 16, the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loves us, loved us. And chapter 3, verse 5, may the Lord direct your heart into God's love. Beyond that, Paul says, not only did he love us, but he chose us in verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for your brother's love by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you. Now, we can get into a debate about uh, pre-election and all that kind of stuff. Uh, We can talk Calvinism and Arminianism, and the fact is we can talk about it all day, and you're not going to change my mind if we disagree, and I'm not going to change your mind if we disagree, but that's okay. As pastor says often, we can love each other. And uh, you don't have to agree with me. You can be wrong if you want to. Uh, But I I think that everyone has been chosen to be saved. But not everyone wants in on the deal. God has made His choice. Now man has to make his. And God has given us a free will. And so in verse 10, some refuse. And in verse 11, some have not believed. They have delighted in wickedness. So God allows us to have what we want. God gives us what we ask for. And ultimately, God will choose those who have chosen Him. From the beginning, He has known who those are. Thus they have been chosen from the beginning. The Lord has loved us, and the Lord has chosen us. Beyond that, Paul says, the Lord called us in verse 14. Note again in our text, He called you to this through our gospel. Called you to what? Called you that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I just lost two gems in my Sunday school class. Jim Kephart, Jim James. You know, they are recipients of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We all have that anticipation. If we're believers, we all have that assurance. Man, there is a future for you and me. There's a future for us to think about. We're going to share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sign me up. In chapter 1, verse 10, Paul speaks of the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among those who believe. His holy people, his believe, those who believe. Not those who achieve, but those who believe. Did I deserve any of this? Did I deserve to be loved by him? Did I deserve to be chosen by him? Did I deserve to be called into his glory? Well, no, and that's why we thank God for it. It is His unmerited favor, His undeserved gifting to us. So when I get to heaven, nobody, I can't, I can't say, congratulations, Donald Hawkins, you did it. Angels aren't going to gather around and congratulate me on my superior efforts and notable achievements. All of us are going to bow before the throne of God 
and thank Him for His love and His Son who saved us and His Spirit who sanctified us. Paul is thankful for what the Lord has done. Are you thankful today? Amen. Well, I could stop here, and that's a good sermon. So I will. No, I won't. Because there's more. There's still more. Not only do we have proclamation what the Lord has done, but we have promise, thankful for what the Lord will do. Let me tell you what God wants to do in your heart and mind. Number one, He wants to encourage us. Look at verse 16 again. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. In verse 17, encourage your hearts. You know, I find it greatly encouraging to know that God is an encourager. God says, you can do this. God says, I have confidence in you. God says, I've got your back. God says, I'm going to help you. God goes on record with positive reinforcement. God is an optimist about you and me. And He wants to encourage our hearts today. That is one beautiful baby. That really is. But look at me. I'm beautiful in my own way. You can't compete with a baby, though. This man, Paul, was big on encouragement. He knew it was needed. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, He said, we sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, he says, encourage one another with these words. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, he says, encourage the timid. You see, the people to whom Paul was writing, not just Paul, Not the author alone, but the recipients of his letter were not living in the lap of luxury or resting on beds of ease either. In fact, they were living in the midst of hostility and persecution. Now, today we have that maybe very limited. Today we might have slanders and slurs, but they face swords and stones. Being a Christian meant you could lose everything to gain Christ. And Paul alludes to their suffering and their hardship. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, In spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with joy. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14, You suffered from your own countrymen. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And people living in those conditions certainly needed encouragement. We need it today. You and I need it. We all need it. God will encourage you. And then he says, God will strengthen you in verse 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father strengthen you in every good deed and word. Oh, hallelujah. Strengthen you. I like that. Strong is a strong word, isn't it? You know, I'm trying uh, to defy the laws of nature. Uh, I'm trying to go against everything that's programmed in my physical body, my genetic order. I am trying to get, I'm trying to rise above the fall. (laughs) I'm trying to get stronger as I get older. Now listen, I I know, I know there's, I I know the physics, laws of physics. I know there's no turning back the clock. No one has ever awakened a day younger than they were the day before. Now, some, with the help of Dr. Nip and Dr. Tuck, may look younger, but they're not really younger. I got that. But I've got a goal for my 70th birthday just a few months away here. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard, but and just in case I don't pull it off, I don't want, I don't want to tell anybody what it is. 
But I'll tell you, but you can't tell anybody, okay? Sometime around my 70th birthday, I want to do 70 chin-ups. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do a chin-up, but it takes quite the exertion. And I know that sounds crazy. I know it does. Believe me, I understand that. But, you know, I just find sanity, after a while, gets kind of boring. And I've, uh, I, I've already taken care of things. Things, don't worry, I'm going to be just fine. Carolyn's going to be standing by with a defibrillator. If that doesn't work, we'll use a fibrillator. The ER is only two miles from my house. I'll be wearing one of those help uh, fallen and I can't get up medical alert systems. <laughs> and my will is updated. And Pastor Brett gets all my unused golf balls. <laughs> but I know, I know, try as I may, there's that inevitable intersection that will soon be met. And while I'm trying to get stronger, I'm getting older. And getting older wins every time. But I still love the challenge, and I appreciate the gains that can be won and the losses that can maybe be uh, delayed a little. I just think we ought to do what we can to take care of these temples. And I don't think we talk about that enough in the church. And there's absolutely a total vacuum of amens right now. Didn't hear any. But if physical strength is important and to be pursued, how much more is the value of spiritual strength? How much more important it is, my friends, for us to develop our faith muscles? Apparently a lot. Because Paul sure talks about it a lot. He says in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, May he strengthen your hearts. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you. 2 Thessalonians 2.17, May the Lord Jesus and God encourage your hearts and strengthen you. Wow. Well, this is a personally awkward. I've hesitated to, to share this, but maybe, maybe it will help some. I did share a brief part of this on a Wednesday night, and I was told that it was helpful. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I, I rarely, rarely heard words of encouragement or positive reinforcement from my parents. They were just not programmed that way. They had not learned that. And they certainly didn't pass it on. My parents were not confidence builders. I don't ever remember a compliment offered to my two sisters. I never heard my parents tell them they were pretty. Never once. And they were. And I've often wondered what difference it could have made, what discovery and development of talent. What seed would have bloomed had it been in an environment where parents would have presented themselves as people builders, encouragers, strength givers? And I can't tell you the joy, the elation that I've, I've experienced in my personal pursuit in God's Word to discover the revelation that God is and is encourager, that God can give me strength and all the faith and fortitude I will ever need. I am thankful for a God like that. Let me tell you about this Heavenly Father. He doesn't point His finger at me to accuse me. He points it to show me the way. He doesn't hold up His hands to resist me. Instead, He uses them to embrace me. Those hands never put me down. They always lift me up. He doesn't raise his voice to condemn me, but to tell me that he loves me. God's not against me. He is for me. He's not my enemy. He's my friend, my shepherd, my good shepherd. He doesn't condemn me. 
and he tells me not to condemn myself. Why, even David on the backside of the cross had that understanding of God. He said, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Proclamation, what the Lord has done. Promise, what the Lord will do. And then we have potential, and that's what we can do. And, they, and Paul tells us, first of all, in verse 15, we can stand on. So then, brothers, stand firm. Stand, fir stand like our hero, Al Roker, in a hurricane. It's a good thing Al Roker is built low to the ground. Stand like a tree planted by the waters. I was on the mission field myself for 10 years. A foreign land called West Virginia. <laughs> and the biggest hometown hero of Clarksburg, West Virginia was Stonewall Jackson. In one battle, Jackson was holding his post against the northern troops, and the Union general saw Jackson standing there, and he said, look at Jackson standing there like a stone wall. And that's what Paul is saying in the midst of battle, in the midst of enemy soldiers, against overwhelming odds. Stand, be courageous, resolute. Stand like a stone wall. Stand against evil. Stand against persecution and hardship. Stand when you're weary. Stand knowing you never stand alone. Stand on. And then he says, hold on in verse 15. Stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you. So we hold with our feet. We hold with our hands and we hold with our heart. Hold to what? The teachings passed on to you. There's got to be some substance to your faith. There's got to be something to hold on to. Hold on to the teachings of the prophets, the apostles, and Christ Himself. Hold on to the unchanging, unshakable, infallible, inerrant truth of God's Word. Hold on. And then he says, we can keep on. We stand on, we hold on, we keep on. Chapter 3, verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love, Christ perseverance. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Persevering, enduring. We're going to make it. Wow. Did you know that? We're going to make it. We've learned too much, and we've seen too much to turn back now. We are going to make it. We're going to make it all the way to the finish line. When we get there, might be beat up a little bit and bedraggled. We may be weary and worn. We may not look like much, but by God's grace, we are going to make it. Christ made it. He knows how to make it. He knows how to help us do the same. We ought always to thank God.